Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to get just a little bit closer to the end of the franchise storyline with Saw 6, working our way through the traps as we go. If you've done the math, you'll recognize hitting the like button to be the correct moral action. To start, I'll unpack the storyline to see what we can learn. Let's get to it. We open on a young woman, tickled awake by a playful cockroach. She stands up and pulls a tripwire, then realizes she's adjacent to her pal Eddie. Simone tries to warn him not to lean forward, but Eddie's a legit dum-dum. With both of them activated, they trigger Billy's entrance, at which point he explains to these payday loan sharks that it's now their turn to turn in their pound of flesh. They are in a competition to load as much of their soft tissues into the trays before them as possible before the time runs out. The loser gets a pretty sweet skull piercing as a consolation, and then the bolts stick in a little just to make it real for them. Eddie has a thirst for life and is real quick to start cutting some bacon off his belly. But Simone's all trim and fit, oh my, there's no extra here. So instead, she focuses on density and ponders a contribution of pure lean body mass. However, growing desperate when she gets stuck on the bone and seeing his scale moving, she cleaves that sucker right off. This tips the scale at the last moment, winning her the game. We then come in on the end of the last movie and watch Hoffman dust himself off as he circles around to reset and tidy up his kill room, just in case he has a need for it in the future. After that, we meet up with William the Doucher, canceling birthday plans with his family so he can have a drink with Debbie, his lead counsel. They have to review his deposition strats for the case of Mr. Abbott's policy cancellation and practice their David Caruso impressions. Mr. Abbott was sitting right where you are now when we discussed his appeal. <laughs> We see via flashback that William related an oral surgery 30 years prior to Mr. Abbott's current heart disease, using this undisclosed prior condition as a justification for ending his policy, and he didn't take it well. As Will nails his answers with ease, he clarifies for Debbie, our stand-in, that the dog pit identified this discrepancy for him because they are all over it. They love cutting policies and playing hard as hell. Meanwhile, Hoffman arrives at the most recent crime scene where the feds are already in charge. Turns out there were some prints retrieved that match Agent Strom, a disappointing shock to them all. Confident in their suspect, Erickson then reveals his secret weapon, a still alive Agent Perez. We find out that she and Strom had been investigating the building fire from the last film, but had to cut it loose when their witness, Malik the Tweaker, went missing. Hoffman is sour about this deceit, but they all make a pact to hold no more secrets, the basis of any good friendship. When Hoffman returns, he finds Jerno Jenkins looking for a statement. She wants a lead, and she's looking for a juicer, admitting that she's aware of the box that Jill Tuck recently inherited. She offers to dial back her sensationalist rhetoric if he can get her close to Jill. We then learn through Hoffman interviewing the most recent victim. You didn't cut your own arm off? That there's still some confusion here about the concept of duress. Also, that Simone has declined to learn anything after surviving her ordeal, an unfortunate missed opportunity for personal growth. Circling back with Jill then, we see her having a wine and ultrasound party. She giggles about it to herself and then returns to her precious box, embracing her inherited folders in rapturous joy. When Pam Jenkins calls to request a meetup, we learn that she's actually folio number two. Hoffman has another flashback. This one is a reminder that everyone is to be tested, and then he learns that the Federales know the jigsaw piece cut from Eddie was not made with the same knife as any of the other victims other than Seth Baxter, Hoffman's sister's killer. So they're also looking deeper into the associated tapes to verify if they reveal different voices at their core. Feeling the pressure now, he goes to meet up with Jill at the clinic to announce that the game begins tonight, and he's going to retain total control. He demands the envelopes, which she had conveniently forwarded to her office apparently, and then lets her know that when he's done, they're done. Then we get more insight into Jill's more recent willingness to be involved to some degree. Her motivations are driven by her failure to see true rehabilitation at her clinic. The drugsters always come back, except Amanda. She cleaned up her act and was proof of concept for John's method. We then check back in with old poop face Will, taking in some news. Victims have included anyone associated with the life of John Kramer, however remote which gives him a lot to chew on. But then the lights go out, and seeing a shrouded figure approaching with a gun, he adopts a shoot-first approach, resulting in a terrible mistake that he does not have enough time to try to fix. He wakes up at an oxygen bar, sucking on that mango pineapple O2. He gets a personal message from John that says, Hey, thanks.
thanks for giving me a chance to learn how to live through dying. William has 60 minutes to pass four tests, or the explosives on his arms and legs will do what they do. Luckily, he'll be provided motivation to proceed. Unluckily, it comes in the form of his incarcerated family. His first test is easy, though. He just has to be able to hold his breath longer than this lifelong smoker, because every time they move the accordion, their torso compressor closes in a little bit. They each hold their breath real hard, but try as they might, they just can't go an hour without breathing. Of course, Will's got a pair of swimmers on him, so he wins a chance to watch his partner get squeezed like a ketchup packet while he's released. Once out, he recognizes there's a foreign object inside his body, but also is able to grab a key to release one of his wrist bombs on his way out the door. With a moment to breathe now, we see the mother-son duo are in a cell with a huge tank of hydrofluoric acid attached to a sprinkler system and a lever that's just begging to be pulled. Meanwhile, uptown, Ms. Jenkins arrives at Jill's apartment to show her a document she found. She asks her to take a look at it and give her a call if it means anything to her. This is also where she gets snatched, and this is where Hoffman keeps his special pictures. Back in the maze, William thinks back fondly on his first meeting with John, who critiques his underwriting formula for failing to consider the human will to live. Until a person is faced with death, it's impossible to tell whether they have what it takes to survive. We are talking about medical conditions, correct? Coming out of this, Bill finds his next test. He's forced to take up the Pillars of Hercules, and then Funhouse Billy drops in to point out his policy would value this young childless clerk over his older childbearing assistant. Now he gets to see what it's like to make a direct choice, and failure to do so will result in both of their deaths. As their chains are reeled in, he weighs his options and makes a wise choice. In response to her gratitude, he offers some kind words and then leaves Addie to disentangle her own barbed wire noose so he can focus on getting his hands free. Elsewhere in the facility, we see that Jenkins has her own cell full of acid. She wakes up and also has her own tape, which lets her know she's here due to exploiting John's pure message of redemption. Jill finds herself at the hospital with a look of steely determination. As she walks the hall, she flashes back to the rack, where John and Hoffman have a mild disagreement about how to treat the victims, and there's a little bit of disciple jealousy as well. Jill met him here to ask him to stop. Instead, he just assures her he'll provide her a way out when it's all done, and gives her the key to the box. She then drops the parcel and moves along. Back at the maze, William appears to have fallen asleep and is searching for Freddy Krueger. This is the perfect time for an inception back to a prior memory of when John pitched an experimental therapy he wanted to get in on. Not only did William deny it, but if John did it on his own, he was gonna cancel the whole policy on his ass. This was a very eye-opening meeting for John about the nature of culpability. When he comes to, he finds that he's arrived at the next test. Debbie has a brain-piercing device strapped to her torso rather than her head and she has to make it across a catwalk to the finish. William is meant to help her through and be there at the end to assist with the key. She works her way along, but occasionally needs to take turns, getting straight blasted in the face with some steam. And she makes it across, where it's revealed that the key to her salvation has been inside him the whole time. She attempts to extract it with overhead chops from a circular saw, and she must have forgot how he helped her with the steam. So he thrashes her soundly and her device goes off, effectively removing her impulse control. Completely. But for Will, it's just on to the next one. Hoffman then gets interrupted from his evening plan plans with a request to meet up about the Seth Baxter tape. When he arrives at HQ, it's revealed that they found some inconsistencies with Strom's fingerprints, indicating they were not made with a living hand. The tape they discussed is being analyzed, but it's off-site, so they head out together to check the results. Meanwhile, William gets to a door and hears his crew screaming for help inside. When he enters, he finds them playing hard. Natch, but they're sad despite twirling upon the best playground ride available. Then Billy pops in to say what up. We learn the dog pound here is going to spin around and occasionally get blasted by a shotgun and he can only save two of them. He has barely a moment to think his way through when the first victim gets racked up, and just to show it's for real, blasted straight through the chest. When a young mother gets eased into place, he makes his first selection, but this sets the rest of them to lying about whatever they can think of to convince him they're worthy, while also calling each other out. This influx of information overwhelms him, condemning some of them to death. He snaps out of it to make his second selection, which is not the final person. So he's forced to listen as his employee maligns him while he aligns with the gun. At that time, Hoffman and the others arrive at the audio shack, where the expert toils away in a dark closet. She's right on the verge of breaking the algorithm to reveal the true voice. As the pressure rises, Perez starts questioning Strom's motivations. Despite the fact that we get a strong sense they suspect Hoffman, they're taken completely unawares when his voice pops up. He turns on them and only Perez gets off shots, but it's directly into her co-worker's back. 
Once he gets her against the wall, he insists on knowing who else knows before running to his trunk to get his fingerprinting device. He tosses a few around before dousing the room and firing it up. Jill arrives at the command post and sets up a special document for Hoffman to find. While in the cell, Brent decides he's a man of action and goes for the lever. However, he does seek his mommy's permission first. He switches it to live and nothing happens, so he flips it a bunch and leaves it on die. Tara has a light bulb moment though, and sets it back to neutral just in case. At that time, William is searching for the exit and Hoffman returns. When he does, he finds the paper. We find out this is a note that he wrote to Amanda. She had been with Cecil on that fateful night and was the one to entice him to do the job. Hoffman held this over her, compelling her to kill Lynn to prevent him from spilling the beans. Jill then waltzes in to reveal that Hoffman is sitting on an electrified chair. From this, we learn that the mysterious box we can't stop thinking about contained a bear trap for Hoffman, because all will be tested in the end. As she works on this, William rushes through the final door with only a moment to spare. Then the walls pull back and we learn that his only family is actually his sister, Pam Jenkins. The other pair are Mr. Abbott's widow and son. John then comes on to reveal that the game has shifted and William's final judgment is to come from them. Tara gets all high and mighty about her duty to prevent future deaths by killing him, but still can't bring herself to do it. Although her speech charged up Brent, who pulls the lever, swinging down a giant grid of large gauge syringes that fill William with the acid they've been staring at this whole time. Jill starts Hoffman's timer and heads out, so as William melts away from the inside, Hoffman demonstrates his will to live by crushing his own hand to escape, and then cramming his face into the window bars to limit the trap's capacity to open. He's then able to slip down and out of the headgear and walk away with only minor injuries. Well, that was both pleasant and enjoyable. It really makes me wonder what we'll bear witness to in the penultimate installment. But for now, let's focus ourselves on the task at hand by working through these traps. We've gone back to simpler times now and find ourselves with a single trap participant working his way through a variety of fairly locked down puzzles. The difference here, obviously, is that it's not so much about ensuring your own survival as it is trying to bring as many additional survivors out with you as possible. The movie opens with the flesh scale. If you recall, Simone and Eddie had head devices with tension bolts applied to their temples. Temples. Whoever lost the challenge, as determined by the scale, would get a full insertion resulting in a permanent headache. This trap gives us very little to go on, focusing on the character's decisions and will to live. We don't get to see much about how this headgear is attached or what their surroundings consist of. Although I'm not sure searching surroundings would be particularly effective, because they had a very tight timer on this one. I had several thoughts about this puzzle that mostly hinge around winning rather than ensuring mutual survival. To that end, I did wonder if it might be possible to work the flat portions of the two larger bladed items between the bolt and your skin, thus distributing the force across a larger area. If the bolts decided to go for a drive, your survival would come down to which gives out first. The strength of the headgear and its various attachment points and joints, or the structural integrity of your skull. Outside of that, I think this one comes down more to psychological warfare. It would behoove you, especially if you saw your competition go into town on their flanks, to play it up like you didn't have what it takes to strip your flesh. Give them the idea that maybe they're in for an easy win and slow them down a bit. Simone's area seemed to be fairly open, and there's a corner back here that has some stuff behind it. If there's anything there that could reach down the tube to push the tray, she could hold it down and score an easy victory. There didn't seem to be any limited range of motion for the victims, the trap just tries to keep them confined at the table by locking down the tools. However, while the tools are chained, those chains appear to be attached to the wooden tabletop. It seems like your next best bet, after convincing your opponent you're falling apart mentally, would be to try to keep your back to them and use the cleaver to chunk out wedges of the wood until you could wrench some of the tools free. Let your partner load up their scale like they're at a keto farmer's market, and then turn at the last moment to load up your side with a bunch of metal implements. We then move into William's trials. Broadly speaking, he has 60 minutes to complete his four tests. The problem is that most of these tests do require someone to die, but I think there are a few opportunities contained throughout. When he first wakes up, he finds himself in the oxygen exam. What we come to learn is that breathing in causes the device to crush them little by little until they die. It's not clear exactly what kind of breathing device they have on them here. The accordion portion seems to go up pretty dramatically, even when William was breathing normally while unconscious. If it's a life support style device, any 
inhalation will likely result in it pushing air into you, meaning that sensor is going to get tripped no matter what. This is important because my first thought was what if they just take shallow breaths to avoid moving the sensor. The problem though is that there's no time limit here. If one of them doesn't die releasing the other, the global timer will run out and William will die along with his family, as far as he knows. So there's really no choice here but to compete to win and, based on their mutual efforts to try to bypass this, it seems like you're likely to beat this other guy no matter what. This quickly turns into a trap where it would be ideal to try to put it behind you and move on. He then enters an area where he has some time to scavenge for useful items. Just right off here I see some useful rocks and potentially useful shards of glass for cutting. There's also tubing hanging down and all sorts of other things. Who knows what strange and useful items may be contained inside these display stages. It should also be noted that the keys to his extremity bombs are just hanging from strings beyond each task. Any puzzle that doesn't require him to be locked down or imperiled in some way could be skippable. However, they covered this with a simple red light, implying there's some sort of proximity sensor connecting each bomb with the trap that comes before it. This is actually very useful, because while it's intended to keep him in the general area of the test, it doesn't specifically drive him to start it at any particular time. In the case of the Iron Cross here, he's again forced to let someone die, with rules set up that preclude him from saving them both via the game. Either they both die, or he he can save one. However, just because he can't move past doesn't mean he has to pick up the handles right away. In this instance, a strong case could be made for taking rock to glass. Once inside, you could unwrap their necklaces to prevent further injury. You could even then go through with the process of the game to register your choice and make it easier to ensure your ability to get to the next key. Next up is the Stomach Piercer, which is a confusing name because it's intended to shred your frontal lobe. Nonetheless, they went with a torso attachment. I immediately identified that you could just angle your body and head in such a way to avoid full penetration, and was vindicated when they let slip a couple of frames that revealed just that. Because I was looking for it, it was clear they tried to shoot around this, and made sure Debbie never moved her body in such a way that made this solution apparent. However, they tried to jam me up at the end by having the contraption do a little readjustment of its position prior to delivering its load. I'm not sure this is the most efficient way to take out a person's brain, but I understand the desire to introduce variety here. Regardless, while it still may be possible to shuck and jive your way out of this, there's also just the raw power of teamwork as an option. There's a lot of tools inside the finishing area, many of which may have been a possibility for opening up William's wound to retrieve the key. But also, he could have held onto a shard of glass from the previous area as mentioned. With all the steam and heat, it seems like they could have created a fairly safe and sterile surgical environment, and possibly even had access to blood flow stemming cauterization afterward. That is, if Debbie could just refrain from acting like an ass for a few seconds. Before finishing with Hoffman's trials, we'll take a brief moment to note the absurdity of Tara's test here. The end result feels a bit tacked on, and I'm not entirely sure what it's supposed to prove or why it's happening. She recognizes this is her test, but why is she being tested? She's a victim of William trying to raise her snotty son as a single mom. Well, is she not paragliding on the weekends enough to demonstrate she's taken life by the balls? And also, what is the consequence here? It's not stated. He tells her only to pick live or die for William. There are no other rules or requirements. There's no time limit, and there's no other challenge. It's not clear why she has to pick live rather than do nothing, or what would happen if she leaves it on neutral. Perhaps it sprinkles the acid in their cell or in Pam's cell, but these potential twists are never stated. It makes me wonder if we have some important scenes on the cutting room floor that would have elucidated the point of all this. Which is too bad, because without them, this isn't really a challenge at all. Finally, we'll talk about the two primary challenges faced by Hoffman. The first is the kill room, where he managed to take out multiple armed FBI agents with a knife. Now, if you're Hoffman, you did well, but we're going to examine how lucky he got in the way this unfolded. First off, as I said in the summarization, the agents were letting on like they had an idea Hoffman was involved here. I'm not sure why they wouldn't have been watching him more closely. Erickson pulls back his jacket, and as experienced G-persons, both of them should have their right hands open and available for their weapon. This is drilled into them in training and becomes a lifelong habit for law enforcement. But if they did it not by habit, but because they were preparing themselves, they negated their ability to act by also lining themselves up with Hoffman in the middle. This is a recipe for disaster because because it puts you in a crossfire situation. Of course, this didn't stop Perez from putting three rounds into the center mass of her desk jockey friend here, so I'm not really sure where her mind was at. I think the coffee to the face was overplayed a bit. When small droplets of liquid hit open air, they transfer their heat energy fairly rapidly. He's picking up an evening pot of stale-ass coffee and tossing it across the room. The result was probably more startling than painful, but I would expect a trained agent to be able to keep their head on straight. Further, jamming a screwdriver into the 
power strip would not have the desired outcome, so they would have had full vision. If you arc a piece of conductive material between the two ports of an outlet, you can get it to pop and possibly burn out. A single port shouldn't create a problem, but even if it does, this is a power strip. It likely has built-in surge protection, and it's a separate unit plugged into an actual wall outlet. It seems unlikely that it would trip the breaker for the entire room, or that the entire room is on a single breaker. If Agent Perez was suspicious, which the movie led us to believe, her best position would be to listen from the computer station to the left of the audio expert. This would have put her and Erickson at angles in front of Hoffman, allowing either of them to draw down on him with no targets of concern downrange, while still being able to listen and watch him at the same time. Last up is the bear trap. Here's another one that Hoffman successfully navigated, so I'm not sure we could find a better outcome. Hoffman got out of the chair and he cranked on it with some tools. Were better tools available for the job? Possibly, but we didn't get to see what all was there, and this was his workshop. So if he had a C-clamp or some vice grips or something like that, presumably, he would be the one to know and employ them. The bar trick is actually a pretty slick move here, and likely only possible because this was a trap that didn't have its own purpose-built room in which it unfolded. But then again, this wasn't really a test in the traditional sense, because there was no key to recover once the test was passed. I do wonder, after the trap was sprung, could he not have just left it between the bars or reclosed it manually? The trap is set by human hands, so it seems like it could be. It also raises some odd questions here about the viability of some of the other setups, and that he was able to just slide his head out of it despite how low it rested on the back. Pulling down hard will now be a reasonable last resort moving forward. Here's another installment where the average person would come out looking pretty good. There's going to be pain, but the challenges are mostly emotional, requiring the participant to choose who to save while watching others die, rather than putting the participant in actual mortal danger. As a result, I would have to say that you would survive, but the degree to which you would be okay is really dependent on how effectively you could compartmentalize your actions from their consequences. And just remember that I believe in you. Before before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force and Under the Skin, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.